I'm monitoring the chat to make sure that you all can hear me. Um, this is, uh, we're in unprecedented territory here. This is the first time we've done a fully online introduction day. And um, we're really moving directly into the 21st century full bore. It's one of the things I wanna talk with you about today. First, I'll tell you a little bit about Pacific and its programs, but then I wanna spend some time with you talking about depth psychology and the coronavirus uh, so that we, you get a feeling for how we're trying to think about this in, in the face of everything that is happening to us as a society right now. Um, but let me start with showing you a little bit of our programs. I've got a, I'm going to share a screen with you right now um, that discusses our programs. Just give me a second here. <laughs> so hopefully you all can see this now. Uh, in terms of our programs, we have what you see listed on the PowerPoint. Uh, a counseling psychology has, is a department that has two separate programs. One is an MA in counseling psychology that prepares people for uh, licensure as a marriage and family therapist or as a licensed professional counselor. You can actually do both in California. We don't do the testing for the license. That's a separate agency, but we give you the education you need for that. Our, we also have an advanced degree beyond the master's, a PsyD, <clears throat> a clinical uh, doctorate in counseling psychology. And what we're doing um, starting this year is um, allowing our, the graduates of our master's program to eliminate essentially a full year of the coursework necessary for the PsyD because they will have taken it uh, in their master's program. So there, that will be a fast track towards the doctoral program in counseling psychology. And then we have an MA PhD in clinical psychology. The MA is not a um, degree that you use for licensure, it, but it does allow a certain amount of uh, ability to uh, be at various kinds of uh, practicum sites and the like. We have then a series of uh, doctorates and uh, programs in various uh, specializations of depth psychology. It's, that's really our field. It's depth psychology, mythology, and the humanities. That whole perspective is where the heart of Pacifica is. So we have a doctorate um, in integrative therapy and healing practices. That's what's called our DPT program. Uh, we have an MA-PhD program in Jungian and archetypal um, studies. And you'll hear from the chair of that program, uh, Karen Legrice, uh, after I'm finished. Uh, he'll be giving the main uh, talk this morning. Then we have an MA PhD in what we call CLIE, community, psycho community psychology, liberation psychology, indigenous psychology, and eco psychologies. Um, it's a mouthful, but it's a very intense socially uh, oriented social uh, and environmental justice issues are, are very much at the core of that uh, program. Then we have an MA and PhD in mythological studies. We're one of the only places in, in the country where you can get a full-on doctorate in mythological studies. And finally, we have an MA in engaged humanities in the creative life. Uh, and that's more of a uh, arts-oriented and performance-oriented masters. It's again unique and it has wonderful features that I would encourage you to have a look at. This is some contact information that you can see. These are the advisors uh, for each of the programs uh, so that these are your, your primary contact people for uh, whether it's MAN Counseling, that's Pandora Homes, there's her phone number and her Pacifica address. And you can see all of our Pacifica addresses have our first initial, our last name at pacifica.edu. And so you can see that throughout all of the uh, advisors there. Okay, uh, we'll make this available for you later. I wanna move now to um, the second portion of my uh, brief talk this morning. And that I would like to call this depth in a time of Corona. Um, it, it's a little bit of a position paper for us. Um, because of our global novel Corona vice, it's a pandemic. Okay, hopefully I'm back. Um, great. Okay, so with this, um, 
virus, there's an enormous amount of fear and anxiety that is gripping our society. Um, it's disrupting our regular ordinary lives. Uh, it's been the closest analogy people are coming up with, or it's almost like wartime uh, with uh, We lost you again. Okay, uh, let's, good, thanks for keeping me unmuted. <laughs> so the, the images that we're getting here are archetypal. Uh, they're really impacting our collective imagination. So you may feel your own personal anxiety, but know that these kinds of images, like of apocalypse, are archetypal images that, that are really sort of now universal around the globe. Um, and they're fearsome for us, these activations. It, the, the fantasies and fears grab our hearts and minds so that it's very difficult to think about this. And what I want to bring for us is a psychological rather than just a biological perspective, because that's what Pacifica does. So let's see if we can get, I've got about six different areas that I want to just mention briefly. First, virology. You know, this is a virus. Well, viruses are very peculiar creatures, if you want, um, in that said, uh, because they are between life and death. You can actually, if you're a virologist, often you can crystallize viruses. You can get them to form crystals and put them in a jar and put them on the shelf, and they remain active years and years later. They don't degrade. So they act more like a crystal chemical than they do like a biological organism. No energy in or out while they're being in a crystal form. And yet, they are very much engaged with the biological world. So from a Jungian and archetypal perspective, we would refer to these as uh, psychoid. That is, they're in this intermediate realm, having traits both of psychological experience and of physical experience uh, that's inanimate. And it's this gray zone that we're really working in. For those of you who know about synchronicity, this is also part of what we're talking about because Synchronistic phenomena happen at the level of the psychoid archetype. Maybe Kieran will say a little bit more about that. Um, but this is what we're dealing with. It's beyond the normal scientific explanation. So what about origins now? That's the next area I'd like to go to. You know, we're living at a time of great climate trauma. Uh, our world is undergoing an enormous assault by the Anthropocene reshaping of our planet by human forces. And the viruses and the other kinds of things that are, are emerging in the midst of this are evolutionarily adaptive. They're not caused directly, but they are in, environmentally and ecologically a part of what we're doing. We cannot differentiate and separate those off. And so I think these viruses then become, in a way, a certain kind of teacher. They, they make us reflect on, well, what are we doing and what are we going to learn from this? Um, instead of just panicking. So I wanna talk about a few of those things. First is the environment um, that I've just mentioned. Uh, these, these creatures, these viruses began uh, in, whether it's corona or Ebola, oftentimes it's the, when the wild world, the wild part of nature is brought into the market, into the city, and people use it for uh, amusement or uh, food, um, or even disgust and terror, but we lose the sense of the diversity of the organisms uh, that are there. They're, they're valued financially for their rarity, they're exotic, but at the same time, they're not valued in and of themselves. So it's something that we've lost in terms of our relationship to, to nature. That's part of what we hear coming back at us. A second thing that I noticed, and I do a lot of work in China, now, now it's obviously um, online, but I'm still working very closely with a number of Chinese psychotherapists. And we were talking about the viral um, problems that we're having around the world. And I told them about an article that was in the New York Times about two and a half weeks ago, where it showed that the uh, carbon emission has dropped off. Now, in, in China, normally in February, it's the Lunar New Year. So people go back home and the industry shut down for almost a month. And every year we see a dip in the uh, CO2 output because of this. Well, because of the quarantine there, the uh, CO2 levels didn't rise back up. And so after another month of quarantine, what we realized is 
the CO2 levels dropped as much as if the entire state of New York had stopped emitting CO2 for an entire year. That's how much they dropped in China. And that provoked several of the um, participants in the discussion to reflect in ways that bringing the unthought known forward. One said, my God, that's why I felt so strange. And I asked, what did you mean? Um, and she said, well, the sky was so blue. And I felt sad. And I said, sad. And she said, well, yeah, it's been years since I've seen that blue a sky. And it was a moment of great awakening in, in the group because we all became aware of how adapted we've become to these kind of climate changes and just don't have a memory of what an unpolluted world looks like. So awakening memory is another piece. Next one I wanna talk about briefly is isolation because we're all sheltering in place, um, not for a nuclear attack, but we're all going into isolation. And the question is, what do we do about that? Uh, because it can become very corrosive for people and people are very frightened about that. But let me give you a, a couple of suggestions about creativity. I think it's a good time for education, for study and exploration. Sir Isaac Newton, the uh, probably one of the most famous physicists, went into quarantine in the years 1666 and 1667 because of the plague in London. And during that time, he wrote the Principia Mathematica, his great work on calculus and mathematics, including his theory of gravity really an extraordinary achievement, all done during quarantine. So this introverted time where we go into ourselves can be a time for great thought and reflection, especially now when so many resources are available to us online. How do we end this? Now, the second challenge that I see is we've got a very interconnected world. I mean, just look at our event here today. And yet, the challenge for us is to become interrelated, not just interconnected. And what I think that means is that we have to really learn to be more empathic and more caring for one another, that the kind of things that we've learned about psychotherapy over the last 120 years need now to be in common practice. Think of people who are isolated, alone. Maybe we can't visit them in person, but we can connect with them, tell stories. Our lives, the way we interact with one another and our emotions are vital to our collectively as a community getting through this time. The danger, of course, is the next point is depression. And one of the consequences of uh, being isolated can be depression and sadness. This is true economically. Markets crash. Um, you know, we move from recession into depression. These are the where things become more sustained. Everything falls. We try a manic stimulation of throwing money at it, but that only is a limited short-term solution. But from a depth psychological perspective, we need to face into this and try to understand more deeply what needs to change. It's like the underworld has risen up and now we're being challenged. Um, and finally, what I'll say, I'm gonna take my cue from the uh, Colombian Nobel Prize winning novelist, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. I, I borrowed his uh, title in a way. He wrote a book called Love in a Time of Cholera. That's why I said depth in a time of um, Corona. Um, which, by the way, is a symbol of a crown. So there's something very powerful and archetypal even in the image of the virus. But in that story, what Marquez does is he links uh, lovesickness and, and cholera and shows how they share certain things. And I'm going to push the end both a little bit and say depth psychology and viral life uh, have a meeting place in the psychoid. And that's where we need to be uh, thinking and exploring. And I want to invite you to join us in that. Um, in a way, listening to Corona might be the, the um, subtitle of the, the talk. So with that, that's my sort of little brief introduction for today. And now I want to turn it over to Professor Karen LeGrice, uh, who um, is going to tell us um, a fascinating uh, story about the coronavirus uh, from an astrological perspective. Um, so with that, I, I will sign off and thank you all for being here. We really are delighted to have you join us. Great. Um, thank you, Joe. It's very um, uh, inspirational in many ways uh, and some wide, wise words there. Um, my talk is very much in keeping with, with Joe's topic. 
Uh, in fact, we, we named our talks very similarly. My, mine is uh, individuation in a time of coronavirus. Uh, some of you will have seen that, that I changed the topic of my talk. I, I was going to be doing individuation, um, a multi-dimensional perspective, just, just broadly focusing on that topic. But I, I really wanted to say something about how the current circumstance can help help forge individuation, can further our, our own individuation journeys. Uh, so I'll say a little bit about individuation and what that is in, in very uh, general terms. Um, then I want to bring in, as Joe mentioned, an, an archetypal astrological perspective. This can, this can give us a sense, I think, of, of the bigger picture, the timing, and the archetypal quality and content of what we're now going through in, in this, this a very, very challenging moment we find ourselves in. So before I jump into this, just, just a reminder, you're doing a great job at staying muted. That's fantastic. If you haven't yet um, figured this out, you can go to the top right of your screen and change your view from gallery view to speaker view. So you might be seeing loads of little black boxes. If you'd rather just see uh, the speaker, um, and I'm, you should be seeing me. If, if Joe, if you mute your mic, then I, I think um, hopefully everyone will just see me if you click on speaker view. So we've got gallery view is all the little boxes, speaker view is just one image of the main speaker. Okay. So, um, two aims really of, of this talk. I want to kind of give a sense of perspective, uh, as I said, as to what we're passing through using archetypal astrology, which I'll explain in a moment. And I also want to give a sense of some of the things that we get up to here at Pacifica, some of the um, rather obscure and uh, sometimes ostracized topics that depth psychology allows us to engage with. And astrology is, of course, one of them. And I think whichever program or programs draw your interest, you will find uh, ideas that are, are somewhat resonant with what I'm going to speak about today, whether it's the study of myths or uh, the arts and the humanities or counseling and clinical psychology. Each in a different way is, is engaged with understanding the, the deeper dynamics uh, of the human psyche and, and more broadly human nature and the world situation. Okay, so let me let me jump in. Uh, individuation is a, a topic, uh, an idea that I'm sure many of you have encountered in one form or another. It comes from from Carl Jung, um, who is uh, perhaps the most influential depth psychologist uh, in terms of what we offer here at Pacifica. So Jung found in his in his work, he was a, a psychiatrist, and he he found that most people over the age of like 40 or so who were coming to him with problems, uh, psychopathology, neurosis, and in some cases psychosis, were suffering from a loss of life meaning. Uh, they, they'd lost their traditional religious views of life. Many uh, felt that Christianity didn't, didn't speak to them uh, as, as perhaps it used to. And so, they, so they're in a kind of existential crisis situation. And I think we can see Jung's theory of individuation as a kind of response to that. It, it's really, uh, it posits the existence of something like uh, a spiritual transcendent organizing power in the depths of each of us. And Jung called this the self, which is uh, perhaps a slightly confusing term because we tend to think of the self more in personal terms. If you say I, you think, you know, you're referring to yourself. For Jung, that I, that personal I, is the ego. And he hypothesized, um, based on what he saw and, and coming out of his own experience too, he hypothesized that there's another center in the human psyche. Uh, this, this is the self. It's in the unconscious. So the, the ego exists in relation to this deeper, larger, encompassing center, the self. And it's, it's kind of... It, it's you, you in your innermost depths. So it's your deeper self, but it's also in some sense, God. It's a spiritual center. It's the, the universal person within us, the universal God-like person. So through individuation, Jung found and kind of formulated a, a contemporary form of a spiritual path. 
and I, I think many of us today have the sense that we're living our own spiritual journey, that we're finding our own way, that we're not necessarily contained in the religious traditions. And this, in, in many respects, comes out of Jung's theory of individuation, that we're all on our own uh, unique life journeys, and we're trying to realize that the deeper person that we, that we are, that we may not uh, fully uh, understand or um, that we may not be conscious of, at least initially. So th this is individuation. It, it's the challenge of coming to terms with the unconscious and coming to terms with the self. Now, the self is a, an agency. It's, it's an authority. It, it's a center. It's a dynamism. It's part of us that is outside of our conscious will, often outside of our conscious awareness. And so the work of individuation is how do we come into alignment with this deeper inner self? How do we understand what its plans are for us? Because often they, they are not uh, always aligned with what we ourselves feel that we want to do with our lives. And, you know, I think we can see this right now in, in the crisis that, that we're all in, where circumstance uh, and the unconscious manifests often through external circumstance. How that thwarts us, it thwarts our conscious plans. It forces us to change track. It throws us back on ourselves. Joe mentioned that kind of the isolation and the introversion of being uh, in lockdown and, and, and stuck in our own homes and not able to socialize. This is a way that the unconscious can actually, through external circumstance, through what's, uh, what's happening in the world and in our, in our lives, how it can shape us and push us further along our individuation path. And it, it's not always pleasant, just to, to state the obvious, I, I think, Suffering, uh, unfortunately, is, is a key element of, of self-knowledge, of coming to understand who we really are in, in a deep way, and, a, and of the spiritual life, the religious life. Without suffering, I, I think we would just not have the same depth of insight. So one analogy I, I often think of in terms of individuation is uh, the ego, the, the I principle, thinks of itself as like the captain. It's the captain of the ship. And so it thinks that it is uh, able to, to choose the direction of the, of the ship and navigate the course as it sees fit. And the self then would be like an, an admiral of the fleet, that some uh, overarching authority that might have another plan in mind, another course that we need to sail. And so the ego, the captain's job then is to get in contact with the admiral of the fleet and figure out what is actually the the life direction that's intended from this deeper, uh, uh, more authoritative place, the self. So Jung said that the self is an a priori existent out of which the ego evolves, an a priori existent. It's, it's pre-given. It's already there. It, it's, and I think today we often have the sense that we can be the person we want to be. We can shape our lives through uh, acts of free will. We grapple with circumstance and we can be whatever we want to be and you know, there's some there's some truth in that but uh, as, as with so many Jungian ideas they, they're kind of against the uh, the current of the times and so Jung's notion of the self implies that we we have this innate pre-given pattern to our lives like uh, an order a formal order uh, is the way this could be described an, an inborn form and then our job if that be the case, is to try to understand what this form is. This goes back to, to Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, the idea that there's this formal organizing pattern in life and it shapes the flow of events. Even free will, free choice, free decisions are kind of contained within this subsuming larger pattern. Uh, so the, these ideas are all very relevant to individuation and how we uh, begin to come to terms with the unconscious. So what, one other idea here, um, again, one that I'm sure many of you have encountered is Jung's theory of archetypes, that if, if, you're, if you want to come to terms with the unconscious, if you want to come to into a relationship with the self, you have to, as Jung said, differentiate the archetypes, recognize these powers these principles universal principles that are shaping our experience and not only individually uh, but collectively 
One example would be, <clears throat> uh, I think one we can all relate to, the hero. The hero is an archetype and it's something that we can all experience. We can all experience a tinge of the heroic. We can feel one day that we're gonna get up and we can take on the world. We can go out there and get our PhD and nothing's gonna stop us and, or we can face the, the gravest challenges and we're gonna conquer them. The heroic kind of comes over us. We, we tend to think it's like coming from us, from our own will, but Jung would say it's archetypal. You can experience the heroic, I can, and it kind of, it, it colors our perception of the world. It, you know, we, we then see the world as this, something we need to, to take on and, and conquer. Or it's, it spurs us to sacrifice and uh, the willingness to, to withstand suffering. It, it nerves us to, to great deeds. And it, it often can have this numinous uh, spiritual power that you know, we, it, it moves us with powerful emotion. The, the hairs on the back of our neck stand on end. We, we, we tingle. This is an archetypal experience. So Jung identified not only the hero, but many other such archetypes, the shadow, I'm sure you've heard of, anima and animus, uh, the wise old man, the great mother, the child, the trickster. And so a key challenge of individuation is to try to understand how we're moved by these different archetypal principles. How, how is the hero coming through? How, how are we um, subject to the shadow, This is the inferior, uh, weaker side of the personality, the dark half of the personality? Um, and so, very complicated topic, and I, I can't uh, go into it in any detail, but basically the, the idea here is that to individuate, you need to understand and become conscious of how the different archetypal principles are moving us, motivating us, animating our lives at any uh, given moment. And if you can do that, then you'll be better able to distinguish the self, the self as the true uh, universal center of the human being. If you can differentiate the different archetypes, you're not going to be as unconsciously dominated by them. You're not going to be compulsively moved by them in a, in a way that is uh, deleterious and, and damaging to you. But you can participate more, more skillfully, more creatively with these powers and learn to distinguish them one from each other and, and then to attune to the self. So this, uh, in an all too rapid survey, is the work of individuation. So we need some way to come to terms with the archetypes, to recognize the archetypes. <clears throat> and one field that I've uh, been involved in for, for many years now, um, I think about 30 years actually, is uh, astrology. And it's, it's one of those topics like, like alchemy, uh, in, in some sense like um, mysticism or even the study of myths, uh, Gnosticism, one of those areas that Jung got involved in that is outside of the uh, accepted paradigmatic boundaries of contemporary thought. And I think probably that's one of the things that makes Jungian psychology so attractive to, to many of us, that he was willing to uh, look into these discarded, uh, often denigrated topics and draw out their deeper enduring wisdom. Uh, something obviously that we we sorely need in our in our uh, in, in the modern world, and particularly in moments uh, such as this. So I, I got involved in the study of astrology, and for the last fifteen years or so, it's been really the central focus, or one of the central focuses of my scholarly work. Um, I studied uh, with Richard Tarnas, who's uh, pioneered what he called archetypal astrology which, uh, as the name suggests, uses astrology to help us better understand how the archetypes are coming through, and uh, individually and collectively. And he wrote a very influential book in 2006 called uh, Cosmos and Psyche, which uh, may maybe some of you have um, seen or, or read uh, parts of it. So it's got a large volume. And in that book, uh, he details what he calls world transits. And uh, these basically are 
looking at different historical periods and seeing uh, which planets were aligned with each other at those moments. Now, it's uh, a fairly uh, complicated methodology, but the idea is that you can track the movements of the planets and you can look at how they're related geometrically. Are, are two planets together in the sky? Are they opposite from each other in the sky? You can look and see how they're related and that will give you some insight into how the archetypes in the psyche are related. So this whole system is um, predicated on an assumption that the, uh, the, uh, the cosmos, the universe, uh, particularly the solar system, is meaningfully correlated with the inner world, this inner outer microcosm, macrocosm correspondence, such that if you're, if you're looking up into the sky and you're, looking, you're seeing the night sky and you're seeing the planets, you're, you're kind of, you're looking at a symbolic representation of the psyche, the deep psyche, and uh, the planets then each symbolize uh, a different archetypal principle. So again, it's, uh, it's complicated. And if you start thinking about astrology, it raises a, a whole host of, uh, of, of complex questions. But just imagine that there's this a symbolic relationship between inner and outer, between psyche and cosmos. And they're all part of a, a, a containing unity. Jung used the term unus mundus, so one world, a unified world. Um, and inner and outer are more deeply uh, profoundly connected than we are led to believe uh, in, in terms of our dualistic Cartesian uh, thinking. So that being the case, then one can look at, at the movements of the planets and how they're related, and that can give us a sense for how the archetypes associated with those planets are themselves related. So for example, um, <clears throat> Mercury, the planet Mercury is connected, astrologers agree to uh, thinking and um, analysis, communication, the rational mind, um, all, all forms of sense perception. Uh, Venus is related to beauty and aesthetics, uh, love, enjoyment, pleasure, um, friendships, th those kinds of things. Mars is related to aggression and assertion and fight, and the war warrior principle. So you can go through each of the main planets in the solar system, up through and including uh, Pluto, and arguably beyond, but we'll think about that today. So you can look at the, the main planets up to Pluto and the sun and the moon. So you've got a set of 10 planets, uh, uh, including the sun and the moon, and each of those are related to specific archetypal principles. So again, trying to keep this simple because astrology is a, a, a complicated topic, but what Tart, Richard Tarn has found in his historical survey is that you get certain periods of history when two planets, Saturn and Pluto, come into major geometric alignment. And those tend to coincide with uh, epochs, periods of uh, three, four years of what he called crisis and contraction. So what I want to do is just show you um, a chart for today. I drew up an astrological chart for today. So what you're going to be looking at is a, uh, a two-dimensional image, obviously, uh, showing where the planets are today, March 20th. And it's, well, I'll pull it up now and then I can talk you through some of the details. So I just want to show you where the planets are now. And then I'm going to give you some of the historical correlations with other periods of history when Saturn and Pluto were aligned. Okay, the aim here is, is to try to give you a uh, some, some historical perspective and some archetypal perspective, the, the two going hand in hand. So we can see what's happened during other Saturn Pluto periods, and that may help us gain some uh, insight into and perspective on what, it, what we're going through now. So I'll just share my screen, and in a moment you'll be looking at a chart. You won't see me any longer. Again, if you haven't done this yet, go to speaker view, and then you'll get a bigger image. If you've got gallery view, you'll only see a small square. Uh, so one second.
Okay, that's not working at the moment. Uh, Nick, I, I seem to be viewing uh, Joe's screen. I don't know whether Joe needs to turn off his uh, video or there's some issue that I, I can't I can't share my screen. It's just just give me Joe's screen as the option. Are we on the same account? Uh, you shouldn't be. Do you at the bottom? Does it have your share? It does yeah, it have the green yeah, and then share when I button. Click on that, you should get a uh, pop up. I get a pop up. Yeah, and I hit share. Okay, it's worked this time. Work this yep. time. Great. Thank you. Okay, so hopefully you could all see that. So what we're looking at here is. Uh, an astrology chart that's drawn up for 20th of March, 2020. Today, uh, I just picked New York as the location, somewhat arbitrarily. Um, okay, so you don't need to understand this in any detail. Astrology is very confusing, but what I'm going to do is just show you uh, what you'll we'll see here. Uh, four planets are together in the sky. They're all in the same section of the zodiac. Astrologers use the zodiac as a kind of frame of reference. Uh, so everything, all the planetary positions are flattened out into two dimensions, and then the planets appear to be in one or other sign at any moment in time. So just let me switch over to here. This is, uh, we're looking at the same chart again, but now in, in paint, so I can do some scribbling here. Uh, this is what we're looking at. So we've got a Pluto. Pluto is this symbol here. It looks like a P and an L combined. Saturn is this symbol below it. And then we've got Jupiter here and Mars right here. Now, it's, it's rare to have those four planets uh, in come into the same space of the zodiac uh, at, at any one time. It takes Pluto here. 248 years to complete its cycle around the zodiac. So it from here, it would take Pluto 248 years uh, to move all around the zodiac. I'm going to switch back to the other uh, image one second. It would take Pluto 248 years to complete its orbit and move back to the same place. Saturn here takes 29 years. 29 years time, Saturn will have come back to its original place. Jupiter takes about 12 years, and Mars takes about two years. So I mention this because you'll get a sense for how unlikely it is that all four planets will arrive at the same point of the zodiac at the same time. However, if we're just looking at Pluto and Saturn, we get Pluto-Saturn, uh, what these are called conjunctions, about every, every 40 years. So every 40 years, those two planets will come and occupy the same position in the sky. Every 20 years, they'll be opposite each other. And every 10 years or so, they'll, will be, they'll be 90 degrees from each other on a, what's called a square. So these are the, the alignments, the geometric alignments that astrologers look for. They look for conjunctions, two planets together, oppositions, and squares, 90 degrees. So just let me, uh, to give you a sense for the meaning of this, let me read a couple of short extracts from Richard Tarnas's description of this archetypal combination. So these are from, again, uh, Cosmos and Psyche. So uh, uh, this is quoting, uh, this is written directly from Cosmos and Psyche. So this is Tarnas. The, the successive Quadrature alignments, that's the conjunction, opposition, square. The quadrature alignments of the Saturn-Pluto Pluto cycle coincided with especially challenging historical periods marked by a pervasive quality of intense contraction, eras of international crisis and conflict, empowerment of reactionary forces and totalitarian impulses, organized violence and oppression, sometimes marked by lasting traumatic effects. This next, next point is uh, very relevant to our own uh, crisis. An atmosphere of gravity and tension tended to accompany these three to four year periods, as well as a widespread sense of epochal closure, the end of an era, the end of innocence, the destruction of an earlier mode of life, which in retrospect may seem to have been marked by widespread indulgence, decadence, naivety, denial, and inflation. So I think Tarnas was looking at, at um, well, 
Saturn-Pluto conjunctions have coincided with such major historical events as the start of the First World War, 1913-1916 um, was an alignment, so the 1914 outbreak of the First World War, Saturn-Pluto conjunction. Uh, the start of the Second World War, there was a Saturn-Pluto square. Uh, the height of the Vietnam War, um, there was another Saturn-Pluto major alignment. The start of the Cold War, 1946, another Saturn-Pluto conjunction. And then most recently, um, well, one of the most recent ones was 9-11. So TARDIS wrote a lot of the Saturn-Pluto stuff actually in response to uh, the attack on the World Trade Center in New York and 9-11. Um, so we're in a similar archetypal moment. Obviously, the circumstances are different. The causes are different. But the same archetypes are constellated. Pluto is power. It's power drive, will, um, intensity, extremity. It's connected to the underworld, uh, the underworld of the instincts, instinctual compulsion. It's connected to uh, the destructive force of nature transformation and rebirth destruction often of course uh, paves the way for um, trans for, for transformation and, and a cr creative response so this is pluto power instinctual drive the id and Fre freudian sense of the, the darkness and the shadow dionysian power dionysian destructiveness uh, death rebirth so all those jungian archetypes rebirth and dionysus especially in the shadow are connected to Pluto. And Saturn is uh, death, uh, suffering, limitation, contraction, duty, responsibility, constraint, limitation, entrapment, um, time, but also a, a moral stature and um, judgment and work and discipline. All these things are in the complex of meanings that go with Saturn. So when the two planets are together, you put those meanings, uh, bring those two archetypes together. So you get empowered contraction, intense contraction, deep suffering, transformative suffering, and immense labor. This is how astrology works. It gives you a, a map, as it were, of the, the psyche, of the world psyche in this sense. And if you look at the features of that map, you can understand how these different uh, archetypes are related. So I, I think we're in that moment now, rather like in the wake of 9-11, when we, we, we just realized that it was something, that this is a deeply a grave and significant shift in our cultural history. It's unprecedented perhaps in its scale from the global interconnectedness, but it has clear precedence in other moments of history. As I mentioned, the First World War, Second World War, start of the Cold War, 9-11. The last time we had a Saturn-Pluto hard aspect alignment was right after the Lehman Brothers collapse, 2008 to 2011. When you get the same kinds of um, archetypal fantasies that are pervading the collective imagination. Again, Joe mentioned this uh, in his intro, the, the apocalyptic imagination. If you think back to uh, the global financial crisis when it hit, and there were economies like Greece that were almost almost collapsed, they often you would hear that uh, the Greek economists and politicians would say, "Well, we're staring into the abyss; that the whole global banking system could collapse." I think this this moment is uh, arguably worse um, and more intense, but archetypally, it's the same. It's the same. Uh, uh, apocalyptic scenario um, at least that's the fantasy so then our job is to recognize the fantasy to recognize the ways that we are archetypally possessed by the these powerful forces that are constellated at the moment in the collective psyche if we can recognize that we're not going to be as unconsciously controlled and possessed by those archetypes and that that is uh, as I said earlier, part of the work of individuation. So let me give you a couple more passages uh, from Cosmos and Psyche. Uh, periods of Saturn-Pluto world transits alignment tend to be characterized by, and I'm quoting now, 
profoundly weighty events of enduring consequence, violence and death on a massive scale, the irrevocable termination of an established order of existence, collective intensification of division, antagonism and hostility, the deployment of massive, highly disciplined, carefully organized destructive power and a widespread sense of victimization and suffering under the impact of cataclysmic and oppressive forces of history. <clears throat> More generally, this archetypal complex tended to constellate a widespread sense that one's life was determined and constrained by large impersonal forces of many kinds, historical, political, military, social, economic, judicial, biological, elemental, instinctual, too powerful and dominant to be affected by the individual self. So there's that sense that we, I think we all have now in, in to a greater or lesser extent of being kind of trapped by world, world historic forces, um, whether it's uh, orders to, to, to stay at home or fears over the, uh, getting the infection from the coronavirus. Clearly, this is not something that we can just correct or remediate or escape from. We can't take flight from the situation. So there's this sense of being constrained in a kind of pressure cooker situation. And that is the very energy um, coming out of the Saturn-Pluto combination that it affects transformation. It changes us inwardly. <clears throat> so just a couple more um, sections to kind of round out this uh, sense of the meaning of Saturn-Pluto. <clears throat> Again, another quote, uh, Saturn-Pluto alignment periods are also characterized by displays of personal and collective determination, unbending will, courage and sacrifice with intensely focused, silent, strenuous effort in the face of danger and death with a deepening capacity for moral discernment born from experience and suffering and with the transformation and forging of enduring structures whether material, political, or psychological. So we see there the, the response to the crisis, how it elicits uh, a kind of moral backbone and will, and this, this focused, unrelenting, determined effort. It's kind of stating the obvious, but it's only when we go through these kinds of crises, whether it's in our own lives or collectively, collectively that those qualities, those moral virtues are called forth. It, 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 the extremity of the circumstance elicits the response. It pulls something up from our depths. It stirs a lot of uh, fear and, and um, apocalyptic uh, negativity and so forth, but it also stirs the capacity to respond that comes to it's all part of the same archetypal uh, gestalt so uh, to continue whether for good or ill such periods saturn pluto periods seem to coincide consistently with a collective sense of stern purposefulness and determination a galvanizing of the will against overwhelming odds grim resolution in the face of extreme danger Acts of personal or societal self-denial, intense hard labor, sustained commitment to an arduous task, and a radical deepening of gravitas in the collective psyche were typical. <clears throat> so again, um, I'm reading obviously from a book that was published in 2006, describing other preceding Saturn-Pluto periods, but you can see just how relevant these themes are to what we're now going through. It's a different circumstance, obviously, but you get a sense of like the unconscious manifesting through circumstance and bringing experiences to the collective psyche that we need to go through, however difficult and uh, uh, undesirable they may be. And finally, a frequent theme of correlations with this cycle was the sustained mobilization of collective will and resources to meet a life and death emergency. Again, we're very much in that moment now. Now, let me show you, um, just out of interest, some previous uh, periods of history, and you can see where Saturn Pluto are then. I'm just going to flick back through. So what we're looking now, uh, we're looking at, um, this is the start of the First World War. So this, what we see here is the current positions of the planets in black now, 
March 20th today. And the positions in green are where the planets were in July, the end of July 1914. And you see there, Saturn and Pluto were to again, uh, again together in the sky. So since 1914, Pluto has moved very slowly uh, in its orbit and has now reached this position. And Saturn has completed half and another three full orbits and has come back to this position where it is now. So that's 1914, uh, the outbreak of the First World War. And then uh, what we're looking at here is 1981, October 81, there was a Saturn-Pluto conjunction between 1980 and 1984. I just picked 81 uh, to show you another historical moment where we get a pretty unusual combination of Saturn, Jupiter, Pluto, and in this case, the Sun and Mercury, although they move more quickly. So what we have uh, to go back to today, uh, March 20th, 2020, Saturn, Pluto, I've just described. Jupiter is the planet of expansion, um, breadth. Uh, it's uh, the, uh, the biggest planet, and it's to do, to do with amplification and growth. So I think the widespread scale of this crisis uh, is coming out of that um, Jupiterian archetypal influence. So you get the Saturn-Pluto with Jupiter added archetypally. Um, and I think also the, the closure of many cultural activities and commerce. Jupiter has a lot to do with the, with the cultural life, also travel, the travel restrictions with countries closing their borders. That Saturn endings, block, blockages, limitations, constraints in the area of Jupiter, travel overseas, culture, um, commerce, as I said. And then also here, Mars. This is the Mars symbol. Hope you can see that. So Mars is to do with, uh, among other things, movement. And I think the constraints on, uh, on movement uh, reflect the presence of Mars in that four planet combination. Mars is to do with energy and action and assertion and taking the initiative, the urgency of the actions uh, within this grave crisis, that reflects Mars. The widespread scale, that reflects Jupiter. So you can see, I, I hope, how those four planetary archetypes have come together in this kind of powerful uh, coincidence uh, of, of their forces uh, uh, in, this, in this current moment. And I said it's not unprecedented, but it's pretty unusual to have uh, such, such an alignment. Now, if I go to, uh, this is now November, so I've got, I'm now looking ahead in time. Again, you'll see here, uh, this is where the planets currently are. This is where the planets are in November, the green symbols on the outside of the chart. Um, so, you know, one obvious question when you're looking at astrology is is time scale, and I think especially in in our moment, how long is this thing going to last? Um, <clears throat> and astrology is not an exact science, um, but it's these are the November positions here, so you can see that by November, um, I put in third of November, which happens to be the uh, date of the U.S. general election too, which may be a part of this. Um, but you can see that the planets are still in a close conjunction. By 2021, the planets will have moved further apart from each other. Uh, Sat Jupiter moves quite quickly, 12 years to go around the chart. Saturn takes 30 years. So you'll see Jupiter and Saturn start to move on more quickly. And so the archetypal influence of those planets, those archetypes, is lessened as the planets move further away. Um, but I think we're dealing with these archetypal themes throughout this year. It's not to say that the crisis, uh, the lockdowns are going to last all year, but Ellie, we're dealing with the archetypal where's themes. Where's the volume? The volume? Uh, I think someone's got a question, Nick, on, on the volume. No, it's, it should be up here. So we're dealing with these uh, archetypal themes throughout the year and those planets will come back into a close alignment in November uh, just to give you a sense for uh, how that's going to play out. 
Okay, so just let me break it down a little more in terms of what we're now seeing uh, archetypally uh, and how you'll, you'll recognize the same Saturn-Pluto themes in this, in this current context. So um, <clears throat> the coronavirus outbreak has, has brought about a fortification of boundaries, national, social, personal, closing of borders, the closure of public spaces and stores, um, social distancing and so forth. Shut down and lockdown, stripping away the veils uh, to return to a primal reality. Uh, Saturn Pluto is often associated with like the bare necessities of life. It, 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 it tears down the, and removes the superfluous. <clears throat> so the trimmings of modern life being taken away. The empowerment of a brute survival instinct. Pluto is the power drive, Saturn is fear, self-preservation, self-protection. You put the two together and you get this empowered urge to survive at all costs, which is a, it's a powerful drive. Um, but obviously, if that gets out of control, then you get things like uh, unnecessary stockpiling and a kind of certain ruthless, um, a, a kind of ruthless response when perhaps a, a, a compassionate one is, is called for. <clears throat> So asceticism, some self-control imposed from without or necessitated in response to circumstance. You can see that in some of the previous crises, the wartime footing, having to have things rationed, not being able to get certain items, um, being uh, locked, locked in one place. Uh, so war effort, wartime footing, um, uh, apocalyptic scenarios I've mentioned, you know, we're seeing people walking around in masks, in some cases gas masks, um, and the sense that the world is no longer the same, that we, we are in a different world phase here. It's the end of the world that we knew and we're, we're dealing with a new reality. And I think what makes it so difficult right now is that we, we just not have the time yet psychologically to adapt, to get used to this. And you, you kind of go through those phases of thinking that it's going to go away quickly or denial and it's it's difficult when you enter a Saturn Pluto period to kind of affirm it and accept it. The, the the natural inclination is to take flight because it brings with it intense pressure. It brings with it weightiness and, and suffering and the sense sometimes that uh, it's never going to end. You get Saturn time Chronos. That's one of the meanings of Saturn with Pluto empowering, intensifying. So this intense compression of time, like being in a, in a, um, a hellish situation, a nightmare situation that you feel is not going to end. But that's part of the fantasy. That's the, the archetypal it's fantasy. Okay. I just shut my computer off and turn it back on. And it's you just can, you like, can, you know, that little ring that spins and nothing happens. You happening. can see just by, if you yeah, keep, in, right keep in mind. Uh, yeah, right right Guys, mute your phones. Okay, hopefully I'm back and audible. Please let me know if I'm not. If you keep in mind the previous Saturn-Pluto historical periods, <clears throat> each of them will have brought the sense of, oh my God, this is never going to end. You know, when we, when we saw the World Trade Towers, the World Trade Center Twin Towers collapsed, everyone knew this was an epochal moment and we felt that it was going to be I don't know, World War Three or something that was going to go on and on. And clearly the, the consequences of that are still with us. But we're not, we don't remain in that same intense pressure cooker situation. These things will pass. Or Second World War, First World War, as horrific as they were, they will pass. Um, <clears throat> so astrology can give you that sense of what is the archetypal quality of the moment and what is the timing of this? And this year, these archetypal energies are powerfully constellated, less so next year, they start to move out. And then the, the, the Saturn Pluto is done by 2021, by the end of 2021. Um, so keep in mind that that historical sense of uh, the, the cycles and the way that they come in and they move on, and they come in and they move on. <clears throat> So another thing we, a consequence of this uh, is the blocking, repression, and containment of libido. If you can't go about your ordinary life as you would like to, you can't go and see your friends and 
go to the theater and uh, go, go shopping in, in, in town or whatnot, the energy that you would have spent, or even go to work, the energy that you would have spent on these activities has nowhere uh, to go or doesn't have the same outlet, the same avenues of expression. So the, you then, you're then sitting with the energy that you normally would have expended in the, act, in the acts of life. And that, that energy then can go back and activate the unconscious. And, uh, and then that feeds into, well, how do you handle these energies? You've got these powerful um, drives to survive and fears coming up. You have to learn to handle them. So that's Saturn Pluto in its association with discipline, asceticism. Can you remain calm and master and control these energies? That's all part of the Saturn Pluto uh, challenge and it, even uh, this rather, rather peculiar um, way of life we've had to move into with constantly you know washing hands and um, sanitizing and wi wiping surfaces down and all that even that comes out of Saturn Pluto some of you may have seen a TV show called Monk uh, and it's a, about a, a a detective with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. This came out in 2002 during a Saturn Pluto opposition, the 9 11 um, configuration. <clears throat> and it, it features this, this detective who's constantly wiping his hands. He's, he's, he's constantly in the same routine, obsessed with cleanliness and tidiness. And in some sense, we're all enacting that Saturn Pluto kind of compulsive. Uh, fastidiousness and hygiene practice now so you again you get the same patterns of behavior the same themes that are constellated during different um, transits okay so how can Saturn Pluto and awareness of Saturn Pluto uh, I'll come back to the main view now how, how can that help us on our own individuation journeys well, uh, Saturn Pluto, it's um, very much connected with what Jung called as the, the Herculean labor of facing the unconscious. You have to face up to your own shadow, the, the, the stirred instincts, the fears that grab us all. So there's that uh, effort and energy to be steadfast in facing the unconscious. <clears throat> it, it brings an end to that more natural unconscious mode of existence that we've all um i think been in at least <laughs> relative to where we are now so it's this ending of an era and the kind of shifting to having to be more intensely conscious individuation is very much to do with becoming more conscious making the unconscious conscious and these kind of crises stir up the deeper uh, compulsions and fears within us in order that they can be integrated into consciousness i think that's a key um aspect of what's happening here psychologically so in doing that we become more whole we become more whole because we're facing the darker side of the psyche we're having to face that and we're having to integrate it so as difficult as it is there is an opportunity here psycholog psychologically to understand something um, something of human nature something of our own nature and integrate some of those usually latent fears and drives that exist within all of us that are now coming to the surface can we can we contain them how do we do this how do we uh, face with moral courage the shadow aspects of human nature that are now coming to come into the surface um, and then this moral strengthening of, of consciousness you remember the uh, quote i read from richard tarnas Pluto Saturn fortifies us. It gives us backbone and moral gravitas. And so it kind of forges in those kinds of virtues that, that, that we need. And so as difficult as it is at the time, you can probably look back, if you look back at Saturn Pluto periods in your life, um, and you hopefully got to look back on this period and see how it kind of forged you in certain ways that you probably can't see right now in the midst of the crisis. Now, just a couple of things uh, to, to close here. Um, depth psychology can help us. Joe, Joe began with this. It can help us because it, it enables us to become aware that we are caught in a particular archetypal fantasy. James Hillman said that archetypes bedazzle consciousness. 
they bedazzle us and they make they make consciousness blind to its own stance we don't realize that we're possessed we don't realize that we're caught in a particular uh, archetypal complex that shapes the way we see the world it shapes our somatic reaction uh, how we feel emotionally um, our, our entire perception our entire worldview it tends to be colored by a particular archetypal fantasy so depth psychology fosters this pluralistic uh, understanding of different archetypal worlds and how we participate in these worlds when we, we move from one to the other saturn pluto tends to make us kind of locked down and and singularly caught up in a, a in this fantasy so it can be very helpful to try to move to a different archetypal reality go to youtube watch some old film clips play some music videos do something to move your consciousness out of the, the saturn pluto into a different place psychologically then you can see saturn pluto from more with a clearer um, perspective studying myths studying works of art things that we do here in the programs at pacifico addressing psychopathology in in clinical settings in counseling um, or if you come to the Jungian program, understanding archetypes and the way that they come through. Um, that's a key element of uh, the Jungian program here. So uh, the last thing then, it, I think this whole situation enc encourages us to look at the deeper meaning here. What is the telos? This is a word that's often used coming out of teleology. What is the telos of the self, of the unconscious, that, that's manifesting through this this uh, horrific virus situation it's it's thwarting us it's blocking us it's throwing us back on ourselves to what end in what way is it changing us depth psychology gives us the uh, the inclination and the capacity to try to discern the underlying meanings that may not be apparent in our more immediate direct response to this crisis so that's um I think the note on, on which I'd like to like to end. If you're more interested in uh, learning more, if you're interested in learning more about archetypal astrology, uh, we can follow up. I can give some recommendations. We're actually doing a um, a series of uh, of online courses through the retreat center at Pacifica starting in the fall. So look out for more news on that. But I'd like to at least give you a chance to ask a couple of questions. Um, if there are any uh, confusions or things you'd like to elaborate. Um, please feel free to type your question in the chat box. Nick, anything that's come yeah, through so far? There's been a couple, and I'll try to sort of get to them from the top and, and work down a little bit. Um, and David Odoricio, um, thanks, David, for jumping on here, one of our myth core faculty or myth faculty and um, also director of the retreat center. Um, but just a question about the benchmarks. Um, seem western focused and there's contractions and things happening all over around the world every year right so just maybe commenting on that oh so this i mean well in this case clearly it's it's a, a global phenomenon uh, phenomenon as jay mentioned it, it began in china um astrology the astrology that i'm doing it comes out of the western tradition but um uh, the, the recognition in Jungian psychology is that the archetypal principles are um, universal. They're inflected in different ways, depending on which culture you're in. But, you know, we can all, I think, recognize um, themes of death and uh, transformation, um, the urge for freedom as universal aspects of human nature, whether, you know, whichever part of the world you're in. <clears throat> um, and Tarnas looked at uh, I mean, he's focused mostly on Western history in that book, but he did look at examples outside of the West. Uh, so it's not um, Eurocentric or, or anything like that. Um, but the the planets are named after the Greco-Roman gods, and that gives it its uh, Western stamp. But I think what we're dealing with here is um, universal archetypes in the way that they constellate and manifest in different different ways in different contexts around the world. We just in this case, clearly we're looking at a kind of uh, global manifestation of, of this, the same um, set of circumstances. So good, good question. Um, there was also just to sort of draw attention, there was some good, not necessarily a question, but just some dialogue that took place between some of the participants around, you know, oh, this seems, um, you know, that we're at the mercy of the planets 
with how this laid out and there were some responses to that from some of the participants. Right. I don't know if you want, there's other questions coming in, but I don't know if, if you wanted to Okay, yeah, I'll say that something. So that's, a, that's a great point. I mean, I think it, it seems to me that one um, misconception, an understandable one with, with astrology is that um, the, 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 the planets are like these um, evil demiurge or uh, Gnostic archons that are uh, arbitrarily inflicting misery on us from above but this is coming out of our own experience so even though we're looking at archetypes as something that are outside of the human will we, don't, we can't will these things away we can't control them consciously they are a part of our own nature and the things that we see in the world are not um they participate in the archetypes in the archetypal themes but it's not the case of like a top-down uh, hierarchy of gods or something that is is uh, inflicting things on us uh, it's saturn pluto is your own your own um, urge to survive your own uh, sense of being in a pressure cooker that is the way that saturn pluto comes through uh, it's just that the astrology is like a, a perspective that allows us to illuminate the themes we can obviously understand the causes. If you look at the coronavirus, you could look at a chain of causes about how this developed. Again, Joe mentioned this the way he began. So astrology is not something that you then, uh, it's not something, an extra set of causes. It's manifesting through the causes. It illuminates the causes. It's a different kind of causation astrology. It's to do with, um, as I mentioned earlier, the form, the pattern of things, the formal cause. Uh, not like cause and effect a causes b causes c so it's describing the the themes that we're now in that are constellated by uh, the flow of events of world history and how we respond to them it, it includes um, our conscious reactions it includes circumstance it includes uh, fantasies that are coming up from the unconscious so it's a kind of meta view uh, that enables us to um, better discern the archetypal themes in, in the current moment and therefore hopefully not be as uh, controlled by them, not be as blinded by them. Um, so that's the idea, but it's, it's a great, great point. All right, and just being you know mindful of time in the 11.30 breakouts, we'll try to get to as many, we've got questions mm -hmm. coming in, um, but I wanna read James's question here. Uh, he says, my questions would be around the idea of the nature of the causative forces that actually do connect the apparently vast different distance between the conceptual realms of the external universe and our internal psyche. Yeah. Is our psyche and the material world in which we experience planets connected by one universal fabric that would explain these correlations, or is it all just one big case study of confirmation bias? And he says, these are all fun ideas to think about. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, 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 can't, I can't give it a simple answer um, within a minute, but I will, I will try. I think with astrology, there is some projection. There, if you look at, you know, go, go and read some astrology books, a lot of people are projecting their own uh, archetypal worlds and uh, insights onto uh, outer space. And so I don't dispute that. But I do think there is a, a deeper ground to this. I mentioned Jung's idea of the uh, Unus Mundus, that the psyche, the inner world, and the universe, the outer world, we tend to construe them as uh, separate realms, but um, we can, I think, see them also as related aspects of a unitary ground. If those of you who've uh, studied Jung, you will have perhaps encountered his idea of the, the psychoid archetype, Joe mentioned earlier, and it's basically the insight that uh, the inner and outer realms seem to emerge from what Jung called a transcendental psychophysical background. He, he was involved in discussions with physicists, uh, Wolfgang Pauli especially, uh, also Einstein, and, and saw that both depth psychology and physics were pointing to the recognition of this unitary ground or a unitary field. Uh, David Bohm, um, kind of active between the uh, 50s and I think the 90s, wrote an important book called Wholeness and the Implicate Order in 1980, I think. And he, he has this idea that, that the universe is what he calls a hollow movement. It's a, an unbroken flow of energy. And out of that hollow movement emerged consciousness and the psyche and the material world, space and time, all come out of this unitary 
single unbroken flow of energy. So I think with that kind of idea in mind, you can um, move away from understanding astrology as the causal influence. It's not, gosh, you know, Mars emitting a force that then influences me or you down here on Earth. There's no explanation, no valid, I think, explanation of astrology in terms of that kind of causation. But if you look at it in terms of synchronicity, there's an underlying coherence and correlation between inner and outer, uh, then I think astrology starts to make more sense. Um, probably the best answer I can do within a minute. But if, you're, if you want to learn more, I wrote a book in 2010 called The Archetypal Cosmos. And this gets into these kinds of questions in that book. Uh, speaking of books, a couple questions about if you have any um, additional reading suggestions, books, um, online, you know, articles, yeah. online resources. Um, so if you want to, uh, a general introduction to archetypal astrology, um, my essay, which I wrote in 2007, called The Birth of a New Discipline, um, you could start with that. It's, it's kind of simple and it draws comparison between archetypal astrology and, and the emergence of depth psychology. So I think that would be a, a way in. Uh, Cosmos and Psyche, I mentioned by Richard Tarnas, my book, The Archetypal Cosmos. And then there's a journal called Archai, the Journal of Archetypal Cosmology. And so if you Google Archai, A-R-C-H-A-I, A-R-C-H-A-I, if you Google Archai, uh, then you'll get to the journal's website and on there there's uh, a glossary of terms and you can read articles from previous issues for free online. Um, I think there's a whole host of resources there that would, would be helpful. Uh, Young on Astrology is a book that I edited with Saffron Rossi, my colleague who teaches in the Jungian program and in myth and in humanities. We edited a book um, that brings together all Carl Jung's writings on astrology that came out a couple of years ago, which is called Young on Astrology. Um, same time, Liz Green, a well-known astrologer, she brought out two books uh, in this area too, Young Studies of Astrology and the Astrology in the Red Book. Very interesting. Um, there's a whole lo lo load of stuff out there. But go for the, the higher level archetypal depth psychology kind of astrology rather than the pop stuff, which is helpful. The popular stuff is helpful for getting into astrology, but if you want to understand how can astrology help illuminate the deeper dynamics of my experience? You need that depth psychology element. So yeah, hopefully one of those, one or other of those books will be a useful resource. Yes. Uh, thank you. And I, just looking at the time, um, I, we, I don't think we're going to have a chance to get to all the questions. Um, I've saved the questions, the few questions we didn't have a chance to get to today that um, perhaps we can, respond to them on the side. Um, but I want to cool. leave a few minutes here uh, to turn it over to Jessica from our admissions team, um, just to relay some information and sort of set up um, the breakout groups, which are um, set to begin here at 1130. So thank you Great. everyone for that. I'm going to, yep, Karen. I just want to say thank you everyone for, for being on the call and uh, making the time in your day. And Good luck navigating the crisis. I hope that the astrological perspective will help. It gives a sense for what is constellated right now, and hopefully that will enable you to, to deal with it a little, bit, a little bit better. So thanks again for your time, and, and good luck with your applications to Pacific. Thanks, Karen. Jessica. Hi, everyone. First, I just wanted to thank everyone for participating virtually, being flexible with the current circumstances. We hope everyone is staying as safe and healthy as possible. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that the admissions office is still operational, so you are still able to apply to Pacifica if you are interested. You can email all application documents to applicant at pacifica.edu. I'll type it in the chat box as well, but it's A-P-P-L-I-C-A-N-T at pacifica.edu. And also on the landing page that everyone received the link to, if you scroll down, um, you can see the contact information for all the advisors based on program. So you will contact your specific advisor based on the program that you're interested in, and they can answer all the questions you might have about specific application requirements and a little bit more about the programs. Um, as noted in the email, the next Pacifica Experience Day that will be in person, you are all welcome to join free of charge. 
um, what you paid for this uh, virtual experience day will go toward that experience day. At this moment, we don't have a next in-person date scheduled yet. Uh, you know, we're waiting on public health updates and all of that. So you will receive that information as soon as we can. And then right now there will be a small break until 1130 and at 1130 you can click the link to the breakout session of your choice. So go to the landing page, um, view the uh, program of your choice, whether it be uh, counseling psychology or you mean in archetypal studies, uh, you'll just click the link to join that Zoom meeting. Um, after this, you'll just exit this meeting if you go to the bottom right it'll say leave meeting and then you can uh, go back to the landing page and click the um, program of your choice to join that so again we thank you so much um, for joining and as uh, you can see on the screen uh, that's what the landing page will look like and again we hope you'll consider applying to pacifica and we really appreciate you joining thank you